get us started. Okay. Um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce um, Chris Batanga from Colorado State University. Chris obtained his PhD um, with Michael Timko at the University of Virginia. He then came to the University of Minnesota and worked with Jane Glaze book for three years as a postdoc and then um, was an assistant professor at Augsburg for about a year or so before he started at Chicago State. And he's been at Chicago State since about 2009. He's had some interactions in addition to his postdoc work with um, Jane. And he just told me a few minutes ago that he still owns a house here in, um, in, um, in Minnesota. Um, but he's, um, he worked with um, some of us um, who worked on the Tritacy CAT project, the Tritacy um, Coordinated Agricultural Project. Um, he collaborated with Jim Anderson on some of his work looking at some tall off types and trying to understand the genetics of these tall off types in a semi-dwarf um, wheat population. Um, he's also provide, he also helped us organize students that came to the University of Minnesota and other universities as part of the TCAP, students from Colorado State um, as part of the TCAP project, education sort of part of the project. Currently, his lab is working on evaluating cell wild biosynthetic genes in wheat and barley. And it would be great if I didn't really know, know he still worked on wheat and barley. So it'd be nice, it would be great to hear that talk. Um, but today he's going to um, talk with us about um, a really exciting um, project in diversity and inclusion that they have at Colorado State. Um, and this is a project program um, that's referred to as the Illinois Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation. And one other thing I should say about Chris is that even though he's at a small, um, primarily a teaching university, he's been a PI and co-PI on over $10 million in federal grants. And so he seems like a guy that we might wanna team up with in terms of um, writing grants. He's been quite um, productive and successful in obtaining these large grants. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Chris and um, allow him to discuss on this, pro this really exciting program that they have at Colorado State and in Illinois. Yeah. So go ahead, Chris. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Gary. Thank you for everyone for attending. Uh, uh, it's really my pleasure. Anything that relates to the U, uh, you know, takes special attention to me. So I was very, very delighted when uh, Gary reached out to me and uh, uh, talking about the possibility of getting some level of partnership with uh, Chicago State University. Uh, so. Uh, in light of this, I thought uh, I'd be able to share what we are doing in the Louis Stokes Alliances for Minority Participation. Uh, for a start, uh, the talk is structured in a manner that I'll give you a bird's eye view of what this program looks like from a national standpoint. And then uh, we'll leave from here, I'll zoom in to just what we are doing at the Illinois Louis Stokes uh, Alliances for Minority Participation. Now, the whole idea here is that uh, this will stimulate or initiate a discussion or a conversation for us uh, to talk about what we can do uh, to be able to partner, uh, to establish a partnership uh, that can benefit both our institutions. Uh, and in my case, uh, I may bring along not just Chicago State University alone, I may bring about eight or 12 other institutions uh, alongside with, uh, with uh, Chicago State. So. Uh, Yes, so again, very brief talk, again, to just prime us to have a conversation about uh, diversity. Oops. Okay, so regarding the Louis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, uh, it's a program that was authorized by the US Congress uh, way back in uh, 1991. Now, the primary objectives or goal for this program is to be able to increase the number of minority students that are uh, graduating with STEM degrees and either matriculating into grad schools or joining the STEM workforce. Uh, the uh, focus is also on critical transition junctures. In other words, they are, uh, when you have minority students moving from uh, community college to four-year institutions or moving from uh, uh, four-year institutions after they graduate to grad school, uh, we tend to, uh, a good number of students tend to drop at that stage. So we, uh, this program pays a lot of attention at that level. Now, uh, they, these are the groups 
uh, of in the, the cell groups, you have groups that are supported under this program. You have Blacks, Hispanics, uh, Af American, Indians, you have Alaskan Native and Pacific Islanders. And of course, these are the different uh, STEM disciplines that we pay particular attention to in the program. Now, the program hinges uh, largely on what has become known as the LSAM model. Of course, when I say LSAM, uh, is referring to the Louis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation. Suffice to mention that uh, when this program started out, uh, it was only called uh, uh, Alliance for Minority Participation. Uh, the Louis Stokes, Louis Stokes nomenclature or naming came in much later following uh, the uh, originator of the, this initiative, uh, the late Congressman Louis Stokes uh, from uh, Michigan. Now, it hinges so much around what has become known as the Tinto model. Uh, Dr. Vincent uh, Tinto uh, came out with three key elements that uh, really have been found to be very supportive of minority initiatives. Uh, this largely uh, the academic, the social and professionalism. Uh, we find a situation where Sometimes uh, some of the very, very good students, very bright minority students come in, uh, they struggle about just getting blended in, just getting to be part of the STEM community. So uh, this model, uh, we'll talk about it in a little more in the next slide, uh, have different elements or different set of activities that are meant or structured to be able to incorporate uh, minority students, uh, get blended within the broader STEM, STEM community. Now, the uh, three key elements are academic integration, uh, social integration, and professionalism. And to your left, uh, these are the set of activities that are undertaken to meet each of these elements. Uh, of course, we have uh, summer bridge programs, we have peer study, learning centers, academic advising, summer internship, tutoring, research, uh, mentorship, conferences, internship, and you name it. Of course, getting them prepared uh, in uh, exams like the GRE is also a very, very important uh, component that we pay, uh, we pay particular attention to. Of course, each of these activities uh, is categorized under the different uh, uh, two or more of the uh, uh, different STEM elements or uh, model elements. Now, this uh, uh, to date, as we speak, there are over just uh, I think maybe now fifty six uh, alliances uh, nationwide. So this map here is simply showing a distribution of the different alliances. Of course, uh, the U uh, is a lead institution for the North Star Alliance. So uh, I'm quite sure that from this standpoint, this project, uh, this initiative may not be totally new to. Uh, the folks at the U. So again, this is a map that shows a distribution of the different alliances uh, throughout the country, uh, including uh, Puerto Rico. Now, this chart uh, is simply giving an illustration of uh, enrollment data with degrees awarded. Uh, as you can see, uh, here we have uh, enrollment and then here we have the degrees that are awarded. You can see that uh, they, uh, for the most part, uh, very much align with, uh, the, uh, with each other. So it's almost uh, a very strong correlation between uh, the two in terms of the students that come in that the student that, and the student that graduate. Of course, these are students that are involved in the uh, different alliances across the country. Now, uh, that was a bird's eye view to the national program, but uh, I want us to now spend uh, another few minutes uh, just talk about what we are doing specifically within the Illinois Alliance. Uh, the Illinois Alliance was established uh, in, so the program nationally was established in 1991. The Illinois Alliance was established in, 19, uh, in 1993. Uh, over this time, I think we went for a period, maybe about two years that we are not funded. Uh, 
Our most recent funding was in 2019 for a five-year project that was slated to end in uh, uh, 2024. Uh, but I think about two weeks ago, I received a no-cost extension from the NSF uh, indicating that this project will go up until 2025, uh, simply trying to accommodate us with respect to the disruptions that we've experienced uh, 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 due to COVID-19. Uh, so uh, we have, we funded for, so we'll be get funding, funded in this case now for a total of six years. Now, uh, in terms of the Alliance Partner Institution, so we have eight universities, uh, four regional colleges, uh, the, a National History Museum, a Natural History Museum, and uh, a government lab uh, here locally in Chicago. So with the community colleges, we have Prairie State College, we have Morton College, Malcolm X, and St. Augustine College. And then uh, the four-year institutions, we have uh, Chicago State University uh, as a lead institution. We have DePaul Universities, we have Governor State University, Loyola University, University of Illinois, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, Northeastern Illinois University, uh, Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, uh, UIC, that is University of Illinois at Chicago, and uh, University of Illinois at Springfield. Suffice to mention that uh, we don't have student support programs at uh, uh, Loyola per se, but what Loyola is, Loyola provides uh, STEM education research because with this round of funding we just received uh, for a proposal submitted in 2018, November 2018, I think it was, uh, at that time, they required that for alliances that have been around for many years, uh, for 10 years or more, uh, they were required to incorporate uh, STEM educational research as part of their project. So uh, our partnership, uh, the lead for the research component of the project comes from Loyola University. That's how Loyola, <clears throat> Loyola is part of the project. So in essence, Loyola is really, we don't have student, we don't support students at, from Loyola per se. Now, the, uh, it is understandable this uh, aspect of the project that is a STEM educational component came in as a result of the fact that uh, over the years, there are certain things we know really work very well uh, when it relates to minorities, but uh, none of these things are documented in literature. So the NSF uh, decided to incorporate this component, that is the human research uh, uh, resource uh, department of the NSF, division of the NSF, decided to incorporate this uh, component of the project simply to make sure that uh, we have uh, some of those things that we know work, we actually have them in peer reviewed uh, publications. So that's how this piece of the project came in place. Now the other institutions, in terms of other institutions, we have the Argonne National Lab, and we have the Field Museum of National History. Uh, as you see in another slide or two from here, these uh, two are simply partners that serve as, as outlet uh, to be able to accommodate our students uh, for internship. Uh, this past summer, we had uh, six students uh, take part at, uh, in, uh, in internship at the Argonne National Lab. Unfortunately, the Field Museum was uh, completely shut down uh, owed to the uh, COVID-19. So that part of the project uh, could not uh, take place as, uh, in, as, as planned. Now, uh, the Alliance structure uh, is such that we have uh, a leadership team. The leadership teams uh, is basically the co-PI and senior personnel. And of course, uh, we have uh, the, this leadership team is headed by the project director, uh, which in this case is uh, myself. Uh, the Alliance partner institutions have uh, uh, coordinators. So this means that at each partner institution, uh, there is uh, a lead, a faculty member who embraces the project and is uh, able to bring all our programming to their students on their site uh, local campus. And we also have uh, both internal and external advisory committees. Uh, their main purpose is to provide an oversight to the project. And we have a governing board. 
Now, the governing board uh, is made up of either provosts or presidents from the partner institutions. Uh, of course, before submitting this grant, uh, we had to get uh, letters. Uh, I had to get letters from each of the partner institutions I just listed. Uh, I had to get a letter from the, uh, either their provost or their president uh, subscribing to uh, what we were proposing. Uh, in fact, on the, it was on the 13th, Tuesday the 13th, that we had a governing board meeting where uh, I brought uh, the presidents of the various universities around the table for us to discuss uh, diversity and inclusion as it relates to the Illinois Alliance. Now, there is an, as a very strong and rigorous assessment co uh, component, uh, which in our case, we uh, have a Goodman Research Group uh, as the external evaluator for the project. Now, uh, in terms of the uh, of our arching goal for the project uh, is mainly to increase the number of minority students that are graduating with STEM degrees and either matriculating into graduate school or joining the STEM workforce. Uh, that is that is the main main focal goal. But of course, uh, I mentioned the need for us with this current iteration to be able to contribute to STEM uh, literature with respect to STEM education. Uh, so uh, what is it that is working uh, when it relates to minority and why is why why are those things working uh, that is basically the kind of questions that we are trying to answer and also try to understand uh, at the institutional level uh, how what are institutions doing how is the leadership of various institutions doing to make sure that the program remain in place and or what are they doing to inst institutionalize the project in other words when this funding dries out are the institutions, various institutions prepared to be able to keep the programs going? Uh, these are some of the questions that we are trying to look at in our research piece of the project. But of course, uh, the major objectives, uh, more like the national agenda as I projected earlier, it's uh, to provide uh, academic, professional and social activities that will help us increase uh, engagement, retention, and the progression of uh, uh, minority students to obtain uh, STEM degrees. And then uh, we are paying particular attention to the critical transition junctures, uh, say transitioning from two-year to four-year institution, or trans transitioning from four-year institution uh, to the graduate programs. And of course, the uh, third objective is for us to be able to uh, develop and disseminate uh, innovative STEM mentoring model uh, based on the Illinois Alliance's experience. Now, uh, this slide, I just thought I skimmed through some of the things that we are doing, uh, some of the focal uh, activities of the Illinois Alliance. Uh, of course, we uh, support students do research at their home institutions. Uh, meaning that the, uh, each of the partner institutions that I uh, listed, uh, we encourage their faculty members to engage their students to be involved in research and then the Alliance pay these uh, students, uh, uh, pay them stipend uh, while they are engaged in research on, on, in their home institutions. And then of course, the uh, Field Museum of uh, Natural History here in Chicago, and the Argonne National Lab uh, are the traditional outlets for us for internship, where once the students get some experience in their home institution, uh, when the summer months are beginning to approach, uh, they are now recruited uh, at either the Film Museum or the Argonne National Lab. Now, in the past, I've been involved with uh, other national labs, uh, but they, these uh, two, partners, uh, the Film Museum and the Argon uh, were specifically written into this uh, project. Now there is also an international uh, research uh, experience component. Uh, the whole idea here is uh, that of cultural immersion to make sure that uh, the students we prepare here in the States uh, know that research doesn't end uh, within the borders of the United States. So uh, in the past, we've taken students overseas uh, to enable them conduct research. 
of course, such activity could not take place this year for obvious reason, uh, the COVID we are dealing with. Uh, but uh, in uh, 2018, uh, I spent five weeks uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, with five students from the Alliance uh, at uh, a university that they call the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Uh, it's more or less their, it's, it's their quote unquote, uh, their own version of Harvard. Uh, very, very immense university, a lot of resources and doing, doing top notch, top notch uh, nature type, uh, type of research. So. It was quite a good experience uh, for the students and myself having to spend five weeks there uh, in 2018. Now, uh, another component of the project is what is called the learning assistant model. Uh, this uh, learning assistant model and peer mentoring, of course, uh, most of us are familiar with peer mentoring, but what we may not be so much familiar with is a case of the learning assistant model. Uh, it is simply uh, a model that have students uh, embedded within classroom uh, as facilitators, uh, working side by side the instructors. Uh, of course, they are not uh, TAs, the usual TAs as we know them, but they simply facilitate the learning of uh, uh, students, maybe in group activities. Typically, these are students that uh, took the class, say, last uh, semester, did well, grade of a B or better, and come get embedded into the class, and they are actually part of the instructions. Uh, in other words, helping students out and say, hey, you take care of this thing. Uh, these are the kind of things where I stumbled on last time. I think you should pay particular attention when the professor is talking about this, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, it is something that started out, this project, this LA model started out at the University of Colorado. But uh, over the, at the time, one of my colleagues, one of a senior colleague of mine in physics, uh, Dr. Mel Sabella, uh, was one of the lead of that project and uh, literally embraced that project and brought it to CSU, first from CSU in physics and chemistry. It went through uh, all the STEM departments uh, right now, the provost actually is adopting it to get into all disciplines, not just the STEM uh, project. Um, then we have uh, an annual STEM research conference. Uh, what the, this happened, the way we structure this is that we have students from those partner institutions uh, come into, we, we pay for a local hotel, a one night stay at a hotel, usually we'll go in on a Friday we have a keynote speaker and banquet. And then uh, the following morning, students make their postal and oral presentations. And then we close out Saturday evening with, uh, with uh, awards. Now, suffice to point out here that the conference is not limited to only those students that are doing research. But if you are my, a minority student at any of the partner institutions, uh, whether you are doing research or not, you are eligible to attend. Uh, because over the years, we've noticed that when students do participate in such program, that serves like some of a primer to enable them want to seek to get engaged in research. Uh, so this is one of uh, a very, very major piece of uh, the project that has been very, very successful over the years. Typically, following this convention or following this uh, conference, students will come to me and uh, seeking opportunities to get into research and all of those things. So it's a, it's a very, very good uh, uh, initiative. Then uh, with this current iteration of the funding, we have, uh, we incorporated a part that is known as the, we call it the LSAM, Illinois LSAM Technology and Engineering Research Toolkit. So uh, this uh, project was met uh, in recognizing the fact that a good number of our students that are eligible and interested in doing research are not able to participate in research uh, largely because of some structural problem. Maybe they need to take care of a kid, a family member or whatever other obstruction that it is that they cannot really actively be present at a lab and be engaged in research as we would normally expect uh, students to do. So uh, this project uh, was designed to function uh, remotely 
my colleague here at CSU, Dr. Musa Yash, is leading this project. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, this was, this was initiated pre-COVID. Uh, it became very, very handy for us uh, in this current, the current climate in which we are. So uh, it was quite, quite pleasing to see that uh, we were a step ahead of uh, COVID in this case. And then another uh, piece of the project is uh, what we call uh, the uh, LSAM uh, uh, Scholar Summer Program. Now, this aspect, think of it more like a bootcamp where uh, the whole idea uh, I had here was to bring students from community colleges, uh, three, uh, two or three students from, from institution, have them together with those students from four year institution uh, have them get drill with the skills that will enable them to be successful in STEM uh, during uh, a span of a two weeks. Now, the whole idea was that when these students return to their home institution, they now serve as ambassadors to notch their mates and say, hey, you know what? These are the kind of things you should be engaging in. These are the kind of things that will bring or attract success for you uh, in, in, in STEM. Uh, of course, uh, the first year for this program was supposed to be last summer, and uh, for obvious reasons, uh, we couldn't uh, get that going. And then, uh, of course, uh, I've talked quite a bit about the uh, uh, STEM educational research piece of the project. Uh, again, this is new, uh, simply the NSF way of trying to say, oh, well, you are saying this thing is working, this one is not working. Uh, we want to see these things, these items in uh, peer reviewed journals. So uh, that's a key, a major, major piece of the project. In fact, a proposal that were submitted without this aspect of the project uh, were not reviewed. So uh, uh, one other key thing, uh, a major aspect that we have uh, is what is called the NSF bridge to the doctorate uh, activity. Uh, this came as a result of the fact that sometimes, even when uh, we noticed that gains were being made in terms of the number of minority students that are graduating with STEM degrees, uh, we noticed that a good number of them will get into graduate programs and then uh, they will never go through to completion. So uh, this initiative was started uh, as a way to provide a structure that will cater for the needs of minority students uh, in grad school. Uh, I think the very first year this thing came out in 2003 and uh, the Illinois Alliance uh, received uh, her first, the first award for this initiative in uh, 2006. Uh, I think we went through, that, there's a gap period between there and now. We currently have the award right now, but we had a gap period of uh, about two years or so, two or three years that we are not funded. Of course, we submitted a proposal that was not competitive enough for funding. Uh, again, the uh, primary goal of the initiative, of the British Doctorate Initiative, is to be able to uh, cater for the needs of uh, minority students and get them uh, complete their PhD in, in STEM. Uh, the CSU uh, is a minority serving institution and we don't have PhD, we have PhD program, I think it's in education, that's about it. So we don't have PhD program in STEM. So even though we are the lead institution, uh, this aspect of the project is done at the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, where uh, we have been quite successful for the uh, years that we've had the project. So uh, to date, as we speak, uh, we've graduated uh, 36 minority students uh, from this uh, project, uh, spanning across uh, 15 different disciplines. And uh, this uh, suffice to mention that uh, you don't need to have completed or done be an LSAM student as an undergraduate. That is an Illinois LSAM student as an undergraduate. Uh, if you were an LSAM student as an undergraduate from any of the 55 alliances nationally, you are uh, eligible to participate in our program. Uh, students get uh, a stipend, I think it's $32,000 a year, uh, right now as we speak. And uh, to date, we have uh, students that have participated, the 36, well, students that have participated in the program 
has come from uh, uh, 19 different alliances uh, as illustrated here in this map. And of course here, these are the different disciplines from where uh, students have graduated uh, with STEM degrees. So uh, uh, to conclude and uh, have us move into sort of a discussion, a conversation around the table on this uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, one of the key things that uh, clearly is fundamental is that we to really provide a genuine opportunity to minority, we have to ensure that uh, student uh, access should be accompanied by a timely support. In other words, they, they must be support that is timely. Uh, it's very, very important. That's really an underlining uh, critical factor here. So in essence, if we take the U for instance, uh, you may attract a lot of students uh, come into the U, but if they just come into the U and just floating around, and uh, there's no way to be able to assess and see what their needs are and make sure that their interventions in a timely manner, we cannot uh, convincingly or genuinely say that we have provided them the opportunity. So uh, again, Access must be accompanied by uh, uh, timely support. In other words, when interventions are needed, they should be uh, readily available. We can talk some more about this uh, in, in, in our discussions. And then it is clear there are instances where we tend to lower expectations for minorities. Uh, please, no, we shouldn't do that. Uh, we should keep the, the, the standard and the expectations that just as we have for every other student uh, in, in our programs. Uh, believe it or not, you'll be marveled how they'll raise, they'll come up to the bar. So keep the bar up there, just like you do for anybody else. And they'll always try to find their way. Sometimes they may encounter challenges. That's where the challenge, the support we talked about should come into place. But let's keep the bar up there for them uh, to enable them uh, achieve whatever bar we set for any other students in our programs. And then uh, I am a strong believer that uh, successful student mentoring must be within the context of a relationship. We must have, it is really, really imperative uh, that we must have relationship uh, with the students. Uh, uh, again, we can talk a little bit more about this if time permits uh, as we discuss uh, this topic. Now, and finally, uh, on the take home is that uh, student success is a shared community obligation. Again, all hands on deck. Uh, it's not something that is limited to, uh, I would say the uh, recruitment people at the university or recruitment individual or something. No, it's a, a, share, uh, it's a shared community obligation uh, by everybody from faculty to admission officers uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, a few individuals. I wouldn't, uh, for the interest of time, because I really want us. I really want for us to spend as much time as we can just just chatting uh, over this topic. But uh, suffice to thank my uh, coordinators. So uh, listed on this chart are the coordinators from the different institution. Of course, Chicago State is a leading institution. We have uh, an office that uh, with uh, staff members that uh, man the office uh, meeting, meeting different initiative. And then you have my uh, coordinators from all the other uh, partner institutions uh, as listed. Uh, uh, suffice to also recognize the governing board. It was not uh, quite a task, it was quite a task for me to be able to pull together uh, the governing board members, the president and provost of the partner institution for us to have our first board meeting uh, on last Tuesday, the 13th. Uh, that was very successful. Now, of course, uh, appreciation to the NSF uh, for uh, giving us very generous funding to support these uh, initiatives. So at this point, I would uh, yield the floor and uh, hopefully we can now uh, move on to a session where we deal with questions and uh, just talk around the table about uh, issues that relates to 
uh, minority uh, uh, diversity and inclusion. So thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, I, I, I need to um, apologize to you to, at the, my introduction. I think I indicated that you're from Colorado State. Of course, I know you're from Chicago State, so I'm, I'm very sorry about that. I, I, I must have had some sort of block in my blank brain or something. I don't know. But anyway, so Chris Patanga is from Chicago State, everyone. Um, and so this is our opportunity to talk with Chris about um, how we might partner with Chicago State um, and Chris's program, this alliance that he has set up, um, how, how when we bring um, students from diverse backgrounds, um, how do we actually um, welcome them in a way that they, um, they feel comfortable, they do well, they're successful. And I guess I'll just start the conversation. You did say something about timely support in one of your last slides, and you talked about interventions. So what do you mean by, by interventions? What are the sorts of things that... Um, that we would need to do if we start bringing in, when we start bringing in um, um, an increased number of minority students? Yeah, uh, th thank you for the question, Gary. So the uh, intervention is uh, simply knowing what, uh, having a feel from what the students are feeling, uh, being attentive, just being attentive that they may, uh, minority students may have needs that most other students don't have. Uh, what do I need by, mean by this? Uh, if you say, let's say a student from CSU move out there, uh, is spending a summer working with you in your lab, Gary, or with Jim Anderson or any member of your department, uh, it is okay to Take a moment, step aside, and say, hey, uh, uh, La Quinta, what is going on? How hard things? Are you settling in well? Are there any other things we should be meeting for you? Uh, when you initiate such conversation, uh, most of them are very, uh, most minority students, so to say, are in a way uh, very outspoken in that they open up to you and say, hey, uh, Dr. X, Dr. B, you know, uh, last night uh, I really had a problem with this or that or that, uh, A, B, C, or Z. And then at that point you can say, hey, uh, this is how you go about this. This is how you go about this. So it's simply uh, not having things in a wilderness, communications, being able to interact with them as frequently as your schedule permit, uh, just letting them know that you, you value their presence, you value their uh, education. And then they will always pick up with any challenges they are facing because for the most part, if you don't reach out to them, what we see tend to happen is that they will just try to monster, they try to hold up and push the whatever issue it is until they reach a breaking point. And, that bre and when that breaking point arrives, well, they withdraw from the program. And then we'll not be wondering, oh, what happened? Uh, so by saying, uh, being, um, uh, we have to be deliberate, uh, so to say, in knowing what uh, is going on with uh, minority students that engage or interact with us. That's the point. So there's a question on the, um, the chat from Mary Bracky, who I, I think you know quite well. Hi, Mary. <laughs> um, she says, hi, Chris. Based on your experience with the TCAP and the Higher Education Challenge Grant, of which you were a participant between 2015 to 2019, what challenges to collaborative research between MSIs and research intensive universities need to be raised and addressed? OK. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mary. And uh, thank you. Uh, suffice to mention, Mary, that uh, uh, thanks to the, uh, I think that piece actually came from the uh, uh, NIMFA, USDA NIMFA project that conclude, just concluded for us. Uh, the, there was a model that I incorporated in this proposal about this alliance, the idea of uh, bringing uh, students from community college, do research with faculty member at four year institutions, uh, and then to now, uh, that, that is they are doing the research in partnership with. So we had a situation, as you may recall in my project, Mary, where students from community colleges would come to my lab and then they get to work alongside with my students. Uh, that is four year institution students. So they simply, as they are working on the project in the lab during the summer, you hardly could tell 
if there was any difference, this was from community college or from uh, a four-year institution. So this made the transition for those students into four-year institution to be very, very smooth. And throughout the life of the project we had, uh, I think I had a total of about six or eight students. Uh, of this number, uh, four, three or four of them are now uh, seeking to obtain their bachelor's degree. Now, uh, specific to your question about uh, what uh, we need to do uh, based on the experience from TCAP and our recent project, uh, it, it's simply, I really believe that it's simply a case of providing a welcoming environment. Uh, we just, we need to be deliberate about providing a welcoming and a supportive environment. Uh, again, there are things that you may see uh, in my case, haven't been, I've gone through school, at least here in the States throughout UVA, uh, my other experience at the U is mainly majority, quote unquote, majority institution. And uh, uh, what I've seen over the years is the need to pay attention of needs, needs, uh, because what I've seen is that very often students tend to have a lot of needs that weigh them down. Uh, when they, it weighs them down, and if they feel that they are not, the environment is not welcoming to them, they simply withdraw. Uh, so I really would uh, encourage uh, all colleagues to really be uh, deliberate. Uh, sometimes it may mean going out of your way uh, to be able to do it, uh, but uh, I think at least for the start, uh, that is the ingredient. So relationship is very, very important. I cannot say enough uh, as being the very key component that I believe, I personally believe that will be the ingredient for success in STEM. Uh, because students, they value this relationship, but they don't know how to initiate it. They don't know how to go about doing it. And you may have situations where a student, student misses a class. Uh, if the student come to come, you see the student the next time, ask that student, oh, uh, Jane, what happened? Oh, well, uh, professor, I missed a class. Or I couldn't come to the lab at uh, from 2 to 5 p.m. as the schedules reflects because I had to take care of uh, a sick child or a sick mother. Uh, we, we need to be conversant about this, um, the, that the dynamics within the minority community it's uh, more than ordinary. So we need to recognize it. So when a student comes up to you and says something like that, you say, oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I hope your child or your mom or your dad feels better soon. Uh, now, don't end it there. The next time you get a chance to see this student, a week later, the next class, oh, Jane, how is your child doing? Uh, how is your mom doing? And then this really, this, this is a, this, they value this relationship so much. These students, under this context now, the next time these students face a problem, they need a letter for anything, you'll be the first person that will come to mind to them because they believe that you value uh, their well being, you are interested in their success. So, uh, uh, long story short, uh, I think it's simply uh, being able to recognize challenges and bring up mitigations and look for a way to mitigate those uh, challenges that they may be facing. And this can only come through an established relationship, which has to be deliberate. So I, there's another question, um, Chris. Um, that, was, that was great. And Mary says, thanks very much, Chris. So this is a question from Ron Okagaki. He says, I've heard faculty here and elsewhere say that, quote, treat everyone the same, unquote, and they believe that addresses the problem. What are your thoughts about this attitude? Is it effective? Uh, I think you've I, kind of addressed this already, but- um, Yes, yes. No, it's a very, very relevant question that uh, uh, quite frankly, I did not know of this until I joined Chicago State. I did not know of the need to uh, be able to uh, do things a little bit differently. Uh, straight to your question, I don't think that's a very, very good model uh, because the structure or the obstacles that minority, uh, minority students are facing uh, is not quote unquote universal. Uh, uh, 
I, I recognize, we must recognize the fact that every student, all students face challenges, but it turns out that minorities are li more likely to withdraw or retreat from a program uh, when, because again, they will not go out of their way to seek solutions for whatever challenge they are facing. So, uh, which would therefore mean that when you, when you establish that relationship, when you have a relationship with them that uh, they can open up to you, that, that really uh, go a long way. And oh, by the way, if it's going to take for us to treat, be, be treat quote unquote, every student the same by saying a student misses class, uh, reach out to the student and say, hey, you miss class, what happened? Uh, if we were to do that for all students, I think the success rate would be tremendous across the board. So uh, I, I will be one of the school of thought that uh, uh, minority students, if we really want to include them, really want to get them engaged, uh, just giving them access is not enough, as I mentioned earlier, uh, giving them uh, uh, access and also timely support. They really, really, really need support in many cases. Uh, uh, from an academic standpoint, some of them, come from very, very poor, in our case, Chicago State, a lot of our students, a good number of our students come from the Chicago Public School, which they, when they come, you sometimes you get marveled by what a student in college don't quite know, things you think they could have addressed or understood way back in uh, first year of high school, but you realize that you have to take a step back uh, in college to accommodate them. So this may come as a, a good amount of sacrifice from you as the professor or the mentor, but it is worth it because in many instances, they just need to get jump started. Once you get them jump started, they just begin to have this free flow uh, within the STEM, STEM uh, support system. So Chris, I, you've spent, um, you've asked, you've responded um, in a lot of your answers about what faculty should do. Um, what the mentors um, should do, supervisor. What what's the role of the other students and the staff in the in the program? Because the students, any minority students or students from diverse backgrounds that we bring in, are likely going to interact with students and staff a lot more than a faculty member. So, what would you say to the staff and the students that are listening, and and also the faculty are listening now about the role that that they have to play in making the um, department and the program a welcoming place. Right, right. Uh, thank you, Gary. Very, very good uh, question. Remember the point I said earlier that it was uh, sort of an, a community uh, engagement. Every hand has to be on deck. Uh, uh, I have talked quite a lot uh, at length on faculty from the faculty perspective, given uh, the audience, but uh, it is a collective. Every hand has to be on deck. It may take something as, uh, somebody walks into the departmental office the first time and uh, they meet the secretary and they interact with them. Uh, it may require that uh, whatever reason brought them to that uh, office in that, on that particular instance, it, it, it really will go a long way if uh, the staff member who attended to this student uh, reached back to this student at some point and say, hey, I remember two days ago, you stopped by here to address this issue. Has that been taken care of or you still need more assistance? Uh, so it's a case of communication. And then within the student body community, uh, it is um, having groups, study groups, uh, peer mentoring, those are typical structures that have been found to be very, very useful. Uh, so, as I said in my uh, summary or conclusion slide, it's, an, it's a all hands on deck kind of uh, approach or principle for us to be really to get students uh, all included. But those things that are things that you may consider very, very simple and very trivial, but I've noticed that they go a long way in getting minority students feel welcome and accepted. Uh, that is really, really key. Uh, again, it may just take, like the example I gave, someone came into the office, could be the office, could be any interaction. So the environment just have to be conducive and welcoming. Uh, a welcoming environment is very, very important uh, for us to, to be successful. So um, 
again, any sort of interaction you are having with them, uh, make sure that it's positive. But uh, Don is not, I'm not saying, what I'm not saying, as I mentioned uh, uh, previously, I'm not saying we should lower the expectation or standard for them in any way. Uh, no, please, by all means, keep the bar as high as it is for everybody else. Uh, because if you keep the bar up there, believe me, they work hard enough to want to reach that, reach that bar. Uh, the, the challenge may only come in how they get to that bar, but on how they get to that bar is a all hand on deck uh, kind of approach, I think. So, uh, so there, Cindy Tong has a question. Um, so she's she she asks, how important is it for the students to see the other students and faculty who look like them? Uh, it, of course, it goes without saying. It's very very important. Uh, it's very very important. This is a situation where. Um, if you remember the case where I talked, uh, I mentioned earlier about our conferences, our local conferences where we, where we bring students, spend a weekend with us, we pay everything at a local hotel and have them stay in there. It, it, when they come in and see, again, it's open to everybody. It's not limited to, oh, you are doing uh, 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 research with Dr. Anderson. Well, now you have some research findings. You submit a post that can present. No, all minority students at our partner institution are welcome. And in fact, we've actually had students in the past coming to attend our conferences from other alliances. So uh, when they come, it's like the kind of peer influence when they come interact and see, oh, wow. Uh, so you are really a scientist. Because the whole idea here is somehow, they may be in high school or maybe at home or at some level, a good number of minority students don't believe that they are good enough or smart enough to be scientists. So uh, getting them or having them interact with others, uh, uh, seeing a faculty member uh, who is a minority, of course, that would tell this person that, hmm, you know what, if I really put in some bit of effort here, um, a few years from today, I'm going to be like Dr. X, Dr. B, Dr. Z or something. So that one is very, very important. And of course, having someone that looks like, you know, I remember when I came, uh, I came to UVA coming here from Cameroon. Uh, uh, it, was, it was a transition. Uh, it was a transition. I came to class. One of the very first classes I attended was um, a class they call um, uh, Genes and Genomes. It was Gene and Genomes. This class was taken by all life sciences, including those in medical school and so on. I went into a, into a classroom and um, there was one other student there from Ghana, uh, a classroom about uh, 50 students. Uh, first of all, I was marveled by just seeing the classroom setting was not an environment that I was even comfortable with. It, it looked so strange and uh, quite uncomfortable. At uh, the first end of this first class, uh, uh, while I'm trying to you know, scribble the last notes that I didn't quite catch on during the lecture, uh, I had a tab on my back. It was a Ghanaian student. Uh, why did this Ghanaian student come to me? Well, I was a black like him. So uh, to your question, Cindy, clearly uh, having uh, the kind of look-alike kind of things in our campuses can only reinforce uh, diversity and inclusion on our campuses. Gary, there's a few questions. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll put them in Q and A. So I'll start with the the one that you haven't really touched on yet. Um, so this is from Sh Sharon Perron, I think that's her, how you pronounce her last name. Thanks for your lecture, Dr. Batanga. Two things you said made a particular impression on me. One, learning assistance and peer-to-peer -peer mentoring in classrooms. And two, that this is work, that this work is the responsibility slash expectation of the whole learning community. And then the question is: do you have resources or suggestions for instructors on how to build this type of expectation and shared values in a classroom setting? Yes. Uh, if I were to go by the learning assistant model, the way it, is, it works is working here right now for us. The learning assistant model has um, uh, three key components. Uh, there is a need for them to take, uh, there is a course that they take. This course they take uh, is uh, usually it's a one credit course. Uh, of course, we pay for this. 
So the, the limitations we may have as uh, faculty members is whether our administration actually buy into some of these initiatives uh, because there is money involved or required in some of these uh, uh, initiatives. So, uh, and then, so there's that requirement of taking that course. Uh, again, it's one credit course. So all LAs have to take that course in order to become uh, part of the, uh, become, to become an LA. And then the LA themselves get financial benefit. Uh, they get paid. Uh, another benefit to the LA is the fact that, well, as we know in most grad schools, you have a situation where uh, students who have to teach, in the case, in my case at the University of Virginia, whether you brought a million dollars from your wallet or from your uncle to pay all your things in school, uh, and don't need teaching. Uh, it was a requirement for all grad students to teach for at least one uh, semester before they graduate. So uh, this kind of, in a way, is a way to prep students to, when they now move forward to go to grad school and getting to do TAs and all of those things. And then there is a meeting. The instructor has a weekly meeting, uh, typically would be an hour, uh, or so in a week to either, uh, uh, first of all, catch up with the, uh, the LA on what the students are communicating with he or she. In other words, there are certain communications that students may feel a lot more comfortable to say to their quote unquote, their mate, in this case, the LA, and, uh, than they would do for the faculty member. So the LA is able to use that one hour, 30 minutes or one hour period meeting uh, to relay such information to the instructor and at the same time tell the instructor where she, he or she recognized that students were having challenges uh, as the course was going on. Because again, in an active love environment or instruction, formal instruction or lecture setting, there are certain areas that students will struggle with, which, which we don't tend to see, we don't tend to know. So this student uses this meeting with a faculty mentor to be able to give a feedback what they are feeling. And then the faculty mentor uh, will take, of course, take note of these items. And at the same time, prep or assist the LA, uh, prep the LA for a subsequent activity that they'll be having in class. So uh, yes, that's uh, in, in, in essence, the LA model is structured to function uh, exactly in this way. And uh, if, uh, at some point, if this becomes something that uh, uh, the U is interested in, either in your department or the college or at whatever level at, as a whole, uh, I'm sure my colleague, a senior colleague of mine, Dr. Mel Sabella, uh, one of the founders of this initiative, again, that is now a national, so, sort of a national program, uh, will be very, very glad to come talk to you about uh, just the LA, uh, give you data, uh, the, the data, uh, some that are published, peer reviewed, uh, that supports the value of this LA model. So, yes. Thank you. All right. The other question in the Q&A is um, from Axel um, Garcia E. Garcia. He says, regardless of the student's group, I consider that a good advisor-student relationship is key for their success. Absolutely. How different is that relationship when it comes to minority students? I think you've kind of touched on this already, but. Yes, uh, I, I don't, uh, again, is having expectations, uh, set expectations. And when they don't meet that expectation, uh, please find out why. By all means, find out why. Uh, so yeah, student mentee mentor relationship or advisor student relationship, it's uh, critical for any success. Uh, in academia, but uh, uh, if I were to emphasize, I would say that please, by all means, uh, let's not lower the bars. Uh, let's keep the bar really, really high, just like we do for everybody else. But when they don't meet these uh, expectations, uh, or when they don't, we have a flow chart of what uh, the landmark. Okay, week two, week three. Oh, you, you're going to complete this uh, QRT-PCR experiment with four, with five. You go to the field to select your line. So whatever thing you are doing. And if in your regular meeting with the student, 
you re recognize that they are not uh, meeting those landmarks. Uh, in a very calm and casual manner, uh, ask them, oh, the last time we met, uh, this was what we were hoping that you reach. Uh, uh, maybe something is going on. Is there something that is holding you back from really meeting this? Uh, but this, this environment, the environment under which discussion is taking place uh, is equally as important as a discussion. So uh, the environment, uh, I believe, is very, very important. It should be in a very relaxed and welcoming environment because uh, if you uh, sort of try to go with uh, uh, a feast, um, the reaction is um, almost try to be equal in other direction, which is counterproductive, doesn't yield anything. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, more specific to your question, uh, I, I really believe that uh, we just need to uh, be able to find out when things are not going right uh, and know what is not going right. Uh, either from your experience over the years, you can make recommendations of how that thing could be addressed, uh, but a time, mitigating problems in a timely fashion, not just mitigating them, but trying to resolve those problems in a timely fashion uh, is very, 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 very important. So there's another question from Waleed Sadak, and he, he asks, based on um, you, these years of experience with my, your years of experience with minority, minority students, what is the most pressing challenge that you feel they are, they are facing in the U.S. educational system? Uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, the most difficult challenges they are facing in the US educational system. Uh, I think um, I would say, quote unquote, uh, the pre K education um, is failing a lot of minority students. Uh, the K to 12 education, it's uh, in many cases, uh, is where the problem begins. And when they, by the time they are coming to college, they are coming to college in many cases already at risk. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, uh, you and I can really not uh, have a good arms, have our arms around addressing uh, K-12 issues. Uh, again, students come to college unprepared. There are really a good number of them, not all, of course, I'm, well, I'm saying here, a good number of them, but not all, uh, are not prepared for college. So, uh, and very often it may take a good number of us about, we may be surprised and say, hmm, you're asking behind your mind is asking you, but how did this person get here? Uh, so when we take uh, that step back moment, uh, it's simply a need or a recognition or a signal for us that these individuals will need support. and. Uh, it's simply at that point, the, the obligation is to avail ourselves and avail the resources that will provide them the resource, the, the support that they need in order to go forward. So uh, I think uh, if I were to say the most, um, uh, that's, that's number one. So coming very close to that is um, uh, the family structure for the most part and some associated um, things like uh, the system, the social system uh, may uh, not be ordinary. Their experiences in this area may not be ordinary. In other words, uh, typically most of us around this table, when we go home, you are going to check, oh, any homework today? How was school? How are you doing? And things like that. Uh, a good number of these students, especially at the K-12 level, uh, they don't have that kind of support that is available to mo most of us or many of us that someone will care enough to say, hey, uh, this assignment, this is how you should be doing it. Or you want to make sure you complete your assignment. This is what you should be doing at this point, not this one. Uh, they, they, the family structure uh, comes very closely second to, um, comes very second to uh, uh, the K-12 uh, ill preparedness uh, for college that I've noticed. So 
this top two, uh, I would say this, this uh, will be the top two. And of course, the lack of family support will bring other uh, societal challenges uh, into the mix. And they, they, the problem only get compounded, only get, uh, get, uh, the problems only get compounded from here going forward if there is no intervention. And unfortunately, that intervention has to come, typically has to come at the college, uh, at the college level. Chris, Chris, could I push back on you a little bit? Yes, sir, please. <laughs> like you're saying, uh, and I've been thinking a lot about this over the years, right? Here, I sat here in Shoreview, Minnesota, and uh, four minutes from my house in either direction towards St. Paul or Minneapolis. You're in Shoreview, you said? I'm in Shoreview, out okay. by the big towers. Yeah. That's where I am. So, so, so here I sat. And uh, three uh, minutes, four minutes, and to the west or to the east, the graduation rate for the minority students ranks 49th in the United States of America. Mm. And here I sat along with you and my other folks in the University of Minnesota, and we have the tendency to say what you just said. Oh my, there's nothing we can do about that. Well, my my challenge back to you to think about would be and help us think this through we're not going to be successful in the stem program unless we help figure that out how to how to increase that graduation rate how to increase the pipeline the size of the pipe that is moving these students and making them available for for uh, access to higher higher education and that's what i always worry about and we tend absolutely. to say that as academics what you just said absolutely but i i no longer believe it i yeah. believe no. that we have to play a key role in helping absolutely. solve that problem absolutely no sir i'm completely 100 percent with you on that uh don you see uh my when i made that statement uh I or why should have said that uh, we may not have as much control of it as we should be. But no, I'm not saying completely we throw the towel and that we don't have a solution. For instance, uh, on a different project that I have with the Department of Education, uh, there is actually a K-12 component. $100,000 a year we expend on this grant yeah. simply to bring uh this one in this case is six to 12 grade students on our campus we help them with their the the, the gateway courses like maths algebra and all those things uh over the summer we have projects science projects typically in engineering for them to design how you how do uh uh we have uh, uh self-driving cars what's the engineering behind self-driving cars yeah all those sort of projects now we we notice from the evaluation reports we get the students that have participated in our program uh, over the years so the project now this is the eighth year the uh the eighth year of the project students uh in these programs tend to have a grade of a b or better in those courses that most other students are participating with. So yes, clearly uh, there is, we have an outlet to address this issue by going back to get the pipeline, look into the STEM pipeline that is coming. How can we improve yeah. it? Yeah, so my statement was from the standpoint of the fact that it's not like a day-to-day -day thing because this uh, program I've just referred to, students come, it's a Saturday thing. They come to CSU campus on Saturdays uh, then during the summer months, we have them on campus for about eight weeks, uh, engage in different hands-on projects. Uh, but it's not a situation where we are within the high school community that we can, it from, was from that standpoint of either being there or not. So no, you are hundred percent right on, on your point, sir. Well, one other thing I was thinking about, you know, is the University of Minnesota used to have the what was called the University College. Okay. And it was really designed to help underserved. And at that time, the underserved was a lot of white rural kids, mm. right? At mm. that time, they were underserved. In other words, they didn't have the ability to be, to move in the, into, into the STEM program. And there was this young kid from Iowa. 
he couldn't enter the University of Minnesota. He wasn't quite prepared, you know, mm -hmm. but he wanted to perform at a pretty high level. Do you know who that kid was? Mm -hmm. Norman Borlaug. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. All right. So as I think about these things, and, and I'm of the opinion that there needs to be a major new restructuring yes. of these institutions, and not just tweaking it a little bit, but actually mm -hmm. figuring out how to expand, how to depth and increase capacity to really work all the way back through the high schools. Absolutely. And and set it up in a way that they can in fact have that connection and and move it at, at absolutely high standards into uh, into 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 the, into the STEM College. programs and everything. I every time we visit about this, I think about Norm. Oh, <laughs> right, <yeah>. Norm got <laughs> special. Norm got special treatment. Yeah, that's an outstanding example. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Norm <laughs> got special treatment. So why do we worry about not giving people special treatment to Thank to you. get into uh, into the STEM programs and move through and become contributors to 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 society. And I think we yes, would all exactly, agree that Norm, Norm probably did, right? Yeah, exactly. And and to this relates to one of the questions we had earlier about uh, quote unquote treating students in one group. Well, let's support every student that require a need, right? Not just uh, going by the structure yeah. of racial yeah. or diversity yeah. kind of context. Every student that has a need, let's find out what the needs are and provide them the support. Uh, yeah. But again, I have, uh, there's a grant that, uh, again, this, the grant should have ended. We just got a no-cost extension uh, for another year, uh, probably due to COVID, I would suppose, that uh, again, of the $600,000 we receive a year on this grant, $100,000 of it is meant to cater for the needs of uh, six graders to 12 grade uh, in STEM. Bring them to campus, just those gateway courses that they're having problems with, get them engaged in research, engineering, and all those things. Uh, we actually have a template that we are working with as we speak. So no, you are 200% right on that. And, and in fact, we're on the same camp. Uh, I probably, <laughs> my, 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 uh, the context with which I spoke uh, was too narrow. Uh, so I appreciate your pushback, sir. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I have one, one other question. So how can the University of Minnesota partner with minority serving institutions in a Chicago state and other minority serving institutions across the country in a productive way so that we contribute to the MSIs and students might that might be interested in coming to graduate school might have an opportunity to come to the University of Minnesota. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, you have uh, Mary there, Mary and I over the past four years with a USDA uh, uh, grant that uh, she got, we were able to try a few things and learn a few lessons that uh, can be helpful going forward. So uh, I really believe that all it takes, it is going to take you, your, your colleagues, some of you uh, in normal situations coming to CSU to give a seminar. Uh, but in the current climate, we may limit it to doing something like what we are doing right now remotely. Uh, but it's going to require, it may, uh, a, a good starting point is to establish the relationship at our level. Uh, faculty level administrators and things like that. So a good outlet for that, for a good way for us to do that is uh, giving seminars. Uh, that's the very first point. And then when we move from here, I would like for you, the you, to be an outlet of uh, or serve as an avenue for me to be able to send students there to come do internship, uh, spend some time uh, working in the labs with uh, on projects or whatever thing it is. Again, uh, these are under normal situations. At this point, we may we are pushed to retool, uh, retool to do things remotely. But fingers crossed that uh, uh, late 2021, entering 2022, we'll get some level of normalcy. But uh, these are the I, I really believe that this would be the starting point for us uh, on a project that would be beneficial. Again getting students into internship, getting students work in the lab faculty members lab out there. And then um, 
a few students. I've recommended a few students to apply to the U. Um, two of my master students. Uh, one applied. This one, I think, was in microbiology. Was not accepted. Uh, one applied. Um, was I don't know. I doubt she was accepted. But she ended up going to University of California Riverside, where she's wrapping up. Uh, uh, PhD in plant biology. Uh, but of course, these students, in, in this case, in these two instances I talked about, well, one applied was not accepted. Uh, I don't know the outcome of the other applicant, but she ended up going to Riverside. But this all came with me telling them as their mentor, these were my MS uh, students. Uh, uh, when they were thinking about PhD, I say, hey, you know what? Uh, the U has a strong program in this, apply to it. So uh, other than things like this, uh, it's going to require for us to be deliberate in our partnership. Again, the deliberate thing is uh, just starting up because very often me uh, from a plan background, a good, I would say 80, 90% of the students in my department, they come in, they want to go to med school. Uh, that's really, really what they want to do. Yeah. And I was shocked. I literally was shocked uh, in every sense of the word uh, during the TCAP, I invited uh, Jamie Sherman from Montana State. He came to CSU, gave a departmental seminar uh, to us, saying exactly the same thing I've been telling our students over the years. And nobody would really care so much about what I'm saying. But Jamie came, gave this seminar. Basically, she told them about what she does as a plant breeder, what her day-to-day -day activity is and uh, went on to say what a career would mean for someone in plant breeding. To my surprise, following Jamie's seminar, the week following Jamie's seminar, I had five students seeking to join my lab. <laughs> because my, for the most part, my students would tend to not really want Dr. Botanga's lab because, oh, well, he works with plants and things like that. But I was shocked at what uh, Jamie's seminar did uh, in, in this respect. So. Uh, we really have to start off from somewhere, this kind of partnership uh, at some point. Do you have any questions for us, Chris? Um, I know you've been talking a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I just uh, hope that this conversation we are having, uh, we should continue. Uh, we should continue. It's a, it's, it's a process. Uh, it's not a one-time thing. Uh, it's a process for us to get to where we want to be. Uh, it's a process. And uh, uh, I mentioned to you, Gary, about my, uh, the project with Mary. Uh, that was really, really good. And the one that I like, even as we speak today, uh, the framework of it, uh, the tall off type in uh, uh, Jim's with, uh, uh, population, uh, uh, it's very exciting project from a scientific standpoint. So uh, let let us look at this as a standpoint, a starting point for us to be able to go forward. Uh, the luxury I have uh, is that at this point, uh, we may not limit this partnership may not just be limited to CSU. Of course, CSU we are here and. Uh, uh, I talked to my dean when we had our first conversation, Gary, and he really liked the idea uh, of working together with the U. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we should look at this as uh, just a starting point and continue, keep, keep it going, keep the process going. Uh, we cannot get what we are trying to do in a one short kind of window. So uh, as I've, I said in my presentation, it's going to require the commitment of everybody and they, by the commitment of everybody, uh, what I mean is that we have to, we, we need a different mindset in our interactions with minority students. Uh, sometimes they just want to, to, be, to be seen as value, to be seen as part of the system, part of the whole. Uh, if they see themselves as they are on the fringes, uh, we're not going to go anywhere. So. Uh, I, I, I'm just uh, not a question per se, Gary, but uh, simply a call for action uh, in our case, 
uh, that we'll be able to uh, go and keep stay around the table with such conversations and be deliberate in our actions, uh, what we really want to do, be deliberate about it. it, it uh, no doubt, uh, believe me, uh, it's not, it's not uh, an easy task. It's not an easy work. Sometimes you really have to step out of your comfort zone, uh, but with a commitment, with a commitment, just real quickly here, let me tell you some of the things that drives me, that, that gives, makes me have a passion uh, for engaging uh, in this kind of initiatives. Uh, the student I told you that uh, went to uh, Riverside, uh, she should be finishing up, uh, I think this year, if not next. But she joined my lab when she came to me. Uh, well, she first of all, I encountered her in a summer activity, summer project. She was one of uh, eight, uh, six students that work in my lab. At the end of the project, uh, she uh, came out to me and said, oh, Dr. B, I would really want to join your lab and so on. I said, okay, fine, good. Uh, normally when a student come like that, I'll tell them the different projects I have in the lab. Usually there are three different projects that are going on uh, in my lab concurrently. Uh, again, that was like when I was not so much involved in this kind of educational grants that it's a quite a good amount of my time. Uh, I give them the three project options. Which one do you like? And then following this, uh, I ask them what their career goal is. What is it that you really want to achieve? In other words, when you get to where you believe you've arrived, what would that be? Uh, when I ask this student, uh, she said, oh, uh, Dr. Botanga, I'm just, I just want to get a degree so that my two daughters, at the time she had a nine-year-old and a, uh, an 11-year-old, I just want to get a degree so that my two daughters will know that mom is smart. This was her goal. Uh, looking back, I say, oh, wow, okay. Uh, that, I say, that's, that's not a bad goal. <laughs> that was my response. And as we speak today, this lady is about getting a PhD from UC Riverside. Believe it, believe it or not, the life, trajectory, the life trajectory that those two daughters are going to have is going to be very, very different from otherwise if this lady did not have this opportunity to, to earn a PhD. So sometimes I work late night and when I think of experiences like this, that is the driving force uh, behind me. Uh, you, you're going to need, uh, the point I'm making here is that we need to, each of us around the table, we may need to identify something that is pushing us, that is driving us, making us willing to want to go beyond what is expected of you ordinarily as a faculty member. Uh, because sometimes you realize that you need to do, again, just take the example I gave earlier in the talk, that a student misses class, you find out, oh, why did you miss? Uh, and then maybe you have to keep a track, oh, and then ask again, oh, uh, but how is the situation you face that caused you to miss a class? How is that situation taken care of? It, it really may require some of us to go out of our way to be able to do that, but we have to be deliberate about it. So uh, yeah, in, in a nutshell, uh, there need to be something from within us driving us uh, to want to pursue uh, inclusion and diversity. All right, are there any other, thanks a lot, Chris. That was, this has been a really great discussion. Um, thanks for your time. Is, are there any other questions um, that anyone would have? Just put it into the chat box, if not. Um, We'll give Chris a, um, I guess, a virtual um, <laughs> round of applause. Two-handed one. Yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation, Chris. It was great.